students who are doing PhDs. Cuando pregunté a estos estudiantes de la universidad que están haciendo su PhD, how many of them remember the violence in Punjab? Not one hand went up. Thirty thousand people were killed. It was six times bigger than 9/11, and yet no student was taught. How many of you were taught that in the land of the Green Revolution there was violence in 1984 that sent the army in because of that Indira Gandhi, our Prime Minister, was assassinated. This was a major historic event all linked to the non-sustainability of the Green Revolution. And yet, the Green Revolution had to be protected so nobody talks about the violence in Punjab. Am I not having to wait for Miguel? Yeah? Is it working? Working? Yeah, it's good to have you next to me. Thank you, Miguel. Um, since that time of 1984, Look at the record of the destruction. 75% of all species gone again? No? So the story, the, the mythology of the Green Revolution is you have chemicals, you have miracle seeds, and you have an explosion in production. Entonces la mitología de la revolución verde es que usted tiene sementes mejoradas, pesticidas y una explosión de productividad. And farmers are supposed to get so prosperous that they never get angry, never have a movement, and that is why the Green Revolution and Norman Borlaug were given a Nobel Peace Prize. Y por supuesto, los agricultores estarían muy prósperos, nunca protestarían, y por eso que Norman Borlaug recibió el Premio Nobel de, de, de la Paz. But the place where the Green Revolution was first applied, Punjab, was 84, a land of war. 30,000 people were killed. Pero, sin embargo, donde la revolución verde primero comenzó, murieron más de 35 mil personas. And I did a whole book for the United Nations at that time called The Violence of the Green Revolution. It was so clear. Every declaration, they said, we are living in a slavery. We don't decide what we'll grow. We don't decide the price. We don't decide when the waters will come from the dam, we don't decide anything. This is not agriculture. It is slavery and we are going to fight it. But one of the tricks of the industrial agribusiness system is to always deflect food and agriculture movements into something else. The Punjab violence was not allowed to be recorded as a protest of farmers against an unjust system. It was described as a religious conflict when it was not. The Arab Spring in the Arab world was all about food. Bread in Egypt, a vegetable vendor in Tunisia, even Syria was about drought, the kind of tragedies you talked about. Farmers were protesting. What was done to these lands? People have been made to fight and kill each other. Every day in Egypt, 100 to 200 people are being killed. And look at what's happened to Syria. <coughs> So, industrial agriculture, agribusiness, protects its myths. Even though the planet and people are being devastated, 
in the process. 75% of, of the biodiversity is gone. 75% of the water is depleted, mined, polluted. 75% of the soil is desertified, degraded and eroded. And on each of these we have UN treaties recognizing as a very big problem the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Convention on Desertification and Land Degradation. 40% of the greenhouse gases are coming from an industrial globalized agriculture. I did a book a few years ago called Soil, Not Oil. Because the oil civilization, including industrial farming, which is impossible without oil, and the nitrogen fertilizers that emit nitrogen oxides, and the factory farms that emit methane, have collectively given us the biggest chunk of greenhouse gases. And yet, it was nowhere in the climate treaty. So, most of the planetary problems of ecological devastation are coming from the wrong model of agriculture. And if you just look at some of the figures being put out now, the soil degradation of just South Asia, my region, $10 billion a year. In the United States, $44 billion a year. Globally, $400 billion a year. Biodiversity loss is costing us $14 trillion a year by 2015. And the killing of the bees, which has become such a major crisis around the world, it's a hundred and fifty-three billion annually, and a new European study has just assessed that this is 30% decline in food productivity by the disappearance of pollinators. So the agroecology movement is conserving, building, enhancing all of this amazing wealth that industrial agriculture can only destroy. Every agroecological farmer is a custodian of the earth. And it's only in agriculture that we can actually work with nature to enhance the capacity of the soil and its soil fertility. We can enrich biodiversity. There was one, Oriza sativa, the original rice, one Teosinte, and look at the hundreds and thousands of rice varieties Indian peasants created, 200,000. Look at the hundreds and thousands of corn varieties that the Americas gave to the world. That is intelligence. The intelligence of nature working with the intelligence of peasant societies, women, and centuries, which is why having two centuries in this room, I'm compelled to pay tribute to the centuries of agriculture, of peasant agriculture. And if we follow the peasant way, we will have centuries more. The industrial way has probably another five to 10 years to destroy that on which it stands. The land, the biodiversity, the water, and the air. And the farmers, without whom they cannot produce. The only thing they do is tea. I have had to fight so many cases of biopiracy because every time a Monsanto claims to have invented something, all they've done is stolen it from somewhere. They stole an ancient wheat variety from India because it has very low gluten. Actually, it has a silencing gene, which doesn't allow the gluten um, to be expressed, but it has 9% protein. Monsanto patented it. We fought the case. They had to give, up, give it up, but they wanted a monopoly around the world. You look at any product. Was soya bean an American product? That US has a, had the monopoly on soya, Monsanto has the monopoly on soya, and was collecting $2.2 billion 
in the case that they just lost in Brazil because they were collecting royalties way beyond the rightful assessment. And there's nothing very intelligent about what they're doing. This is as crude as primitive accumulation has been. Use of violence to appropriate wealth. One of the latest things uh, we are having to fight is the claim that genetically modified bananas will prevent Indian women from dying in childbirth because of iron deficiency. Now we have wonderful bananas being decorated here. We've launched a campaign, no GMO bananas. Are they bringing GMO bananas to the banana republics of Central America? No. Where are they bringing it? They're bringing it to the countries with high diversity. India, which has hundreds of varieties. Uganda, where the staple food is the banana. Not corn, not rice, not wheat. They eat only banana. Of course the message changes. There they are going to genetically modify it for vitamin A and India it will be for iron. So I did a quick piece of research. Our foods and amazing foods. You know, our mango powder, 45.2 milligrams of iron per 100 grams of food. Turmeric, 67.8, tamarind pulp, 17.5, neem, 25, buckfeed, 15. Everyday foods have 3,000% more iron than the genetically modified banana will give. It has only 4.44 milligram. But why is it being done? And who's financing it? Mr. Bill Gates. He's a big problem. We have to deal with him. Bill Gates is financing one Australian scientist called Dale <coughs> to give us a genetically modified banana. They already have eight patents on it. And as Pedro said, the only reason genetically engineered organisms are being pushed on us is in order to start claiming ownership to then collect royalties. Royalty collection is the only aim of genetically modified crops. On every crown they are failing. We've done a report from Navdanya. We decided to do a global report because right now there's only one report that comes out from an organization called ISAAA, International Society for the Acquisition of Agricultural Biotechnology Applications. They sit near Cornell University and they push GMOs all over the world. Right now they're pushing it in little Bangladesh because they tried to bring a BT eggplant to India we had a huge movement, our uh, environment minister held public hearings and re he was forced to say no and there's a moratorium on all GMO foods in India. There's only BT cotton, but no food. Little Bangladesh is being bullied by the US, by the Cornell gang and this ISAA, uh, ISAAA society only has graphs going like that. They're now finding they count the GM crops three times over. If it has a BT trait, they count the acreage in BT. If it has a herbicide resistance, they count an acreage in herbicide resistance. If it has both, they count it three times over. And that is how they constantly have growth. But I remember in 1987, at a meeting where the industry was laying out its plans to own seeds through patenting, to push GMOs and to have a global treaty, which became the World Trade Organization. The industry had said by the end of this century, that means by 2000, they will be controlling all the food. How much do they control? Four crops, corn, soya, canola, cotton, with two traits, BT cotton, uh, BT, 
where they put the toxin into the plant and the herbicide resistance. And if you look at the results, they said, even now they haven't stopped saying it, that GMOs are the solution to hunger. There's no gain in yield through genetic engineering. They'll, they'll produce more food because they'll control pests through Bt and weeds through the uh, herbicide resistant. Look at the United States, 70 million acres overtaken by super weeds. Half the farms of the United States, devastated. In India, the Bt has led to resistance in the bollworm and new pests which have led to 13 times more pesticide use. The combination of the jump in seed cost for royalty from about 8 to 9 rupees a kilo to about 4,000 rupees a kilo has meant farmers getting into debt. Unpayable debt. And this unpayable debt, the latest figures for this year from the government on farmers' suicides is 284,000. From 1995, when Monsanto started to take control over the sea, most of these suicides are concentrated in the cotton areas. 95% of the cotton is now controlled and owned by Monsanto, which has bought up every Indian seed company or locked them into licensing arrangements. And I'm sure you go through the same in Brazil as we do in India. Suddenly, the public sector stops working as if they can't breed anymore. And of course, the farmer's varieties are taken away in the process called replacement. So there's no supply except the market, and the market is now Monsanto. Every year, $200 million of royalty flow out of India. How are these royalties being paid? Not by farmers becoming prosperous, by farmers ending their lives. Women selling their gold. People pulling out their children from school and engineering college. We work in the capital of farm suicides called Vidharva. And I started seed banks there. We didn't start with cotton, we started with food grains when we started to save seeds. But we've now had to get into cotton. And we've started a movement called Fibers of Freedom. Because if you remember, India got her freedom by spinning cloth. In those days, it was not food that was the basis of imperialism. It was textiles. And the textiles meant that cotton was cultivated by slaves who were captured in Africa and brought to North America. And the machines in England spun this into manufactured textiles, which were then dumped on the world. And Gandhi said, we will not end this slavery if we do not start making our own cloth. And he pulled out a spinning wheel. He did not spin. India had stopped spinning. He found one 84-year-old woman who had a spinning wheel in her attic. And he said, will you teach me how to spin? She taught him how to spin. He made the whole country spin. And when people would laugh and say, how can a few pieces of wood bring you freedom? He said, this is the only thing that can, because it can be in the hands of the poorest woman in the smallest hut who becomes a freedom fighter. And the spinning wheel became my inspiration to save seeds and to fight for seed sovereignty and food sovereignty. Because if we do not reclaim our capacity to conserve, save, exchange, breed, seed. If we do not reclaim our capacity to be producers of food, we will have the end of seed and the end of food because what agribusiness is giving us has nothing to do with food. I call it anti-food. Food is supposed to nourish us. What they are producing as commodities is killing people. It's killing one billion worldwide by denying them of food. And half of the billion, 500 million, are cultivators of agriculture crops. Why are they starving? 
Either they're not growing food crops, if they're growing sugarcane for ethanol, are they eating food? No. But even if they're growing rice, and I have witnessed this in my country, if they're growing rice with chemicals, they've borrowed to grow that rice. When they harvest the rice, the creditor is already at their doorstep to collect the rice harvest. And then they must go back to that same creditor to borrow again to buy the rice at four times the price. About two years ago, they were selling rice at two rupees and they were buying the same rice at eight rupees. That is why they go hungry. Chemical agriculture, industrial agriculture, agribusiness driven agriculture is at the root of hunger, even though it is repeatedly offered as the solution to hunger. Look at the figures. You've had all this acreage expansion of soya and corn. In the United States, it's all corn and soya, GM corn and soya. All of Argentina, only GM soya. Does that mean we have more food? Only 10% of that corn and soya goes to human food and that too against the will of people because it's not labeled. The rest, as you described, is going for biofuel, is going for animal feed, it is going out of the human food chain. This is a commodity system and commodities are not food. Food is very distinctive. Food must have quality. Food must have nutrition. Food must have taste. Food must feed back into the food system. And the most important food system, and Anna Primavesi has taught us all this, is the food web in the soil. If the soil doesn't get food, there is no way humanity will get food and other species will have food. According to the FAO, more than 70% of the food today is coming from small family farms and agroecological farms. That is the basis of food security. And yet, the myth of industrial agriculture wants to destroy the 80% source of food to starve us even further by having more commodities. We have to make sure as a movement that we move that 80% to 100% because it is not just possible, it's the only way we will have food security. But we don't just produce food, we produce health. The minute we avoid the toxic chemicals, you've already brought health into the food system. But from, uh, for, from a few years, we've been calculating the productivity of <coughs> agroecological systems and biodiverse systems. Last year, we decided to convert this into nutrition figures. And the more diverse your food system, the more nutrition you have per acre. There's an entire industry of public relations people who have been deployed to say, oh, e ecological agriculture is very land hungry and therefore they need industrial farming. But if you see the Amazon being chopped down, you realize what model is land hungry. No agroecological farm has had to expand and expand and expand. It intensifies within. It intensifies ecological processes. It intensifies the biodiversity. It intensifies the care. It intensifies the knowledge. The agribusiness model intensifies the toxics. It intensifies the external inputs. It intensifies the chemicals and the water, the energy, 10 units of input producing one unit of food. It's a negative energy equation. No wonder there is starvation. No wonder there is ecological degradation. And no wonder our farmers are having to move themselves out of agriculture if that they stay in that model. Most importantly, the industrial agriculture system is intensifying debt, which is why small farms are being shut down. 
and it is intensifying carelessness and violence. It is intensifying everything we need less of. The agroecological movement is therefore not just an ecological movement, it is not just a food movement, it's a health movement. And the minute we start making that link to health and nutrition, as our study shows, health per acre, when you move away from the measuring the yield of a commodity to measuring the nutrition and quality of food, we can feed two Indians using agroecological systems. We can feed three times the world population, not expanding the acreage, but intensifying the practices. It's totally possible, all the data is showing that. When we start making that link with health, we start making the link with those who eat the food. And the next leap in our movement can only happen when from the seat to the table, from the producer to the e use eater, and we don't use the word consumer, I, I don't like consumerism anyway, but I realized that consumption was the word, you, word used for TB, tuberculosis, in the Middle Ages. You died of consumption. So we should not talk of people who eat as consumers. I know in the slow food movement we've created the language of co-producers. When you consciously make a partnership with a farmer and a producer, you consciously reach out and say, I will make sure your good food gets eaten and distributed. That is the moment we make agribusiness redundant. It's like a heart bypass. You know when there's cholesterol in the body? Then they have to do a bypass. You bypass the blocked arteries. We need to bypass the arteries of food that have been blocked by the greed and violence of agribusiness. And we can do that by making ecological and local come together. And using every innovative measure, direct links, local institutions. You were telling me, Miguel, that 30% of the, the consumption at the social level is coming from small farms in the Brazilian policy. It should all come from small farms because the alcohol producers and the ethanol producers are not going to produce food. I've just, I've been enjoying the oranges and the orange juice here till I was told by Kriti that is because there's so much orange production that oranges are very cheap. And then I think of Florida where they're setting oranges on fire because that kind of monoculture is a recipe for disease. And beyond a point they can't control it and they burn. The real slash and burn agriculture is what agribusiness practices, not what indigenous people practice. Indigenous people practice a rejuvenative agriculture. But agroecology for me is also a solution to the economic crisis. An economic crisis in which the corporations and the banks are doing very well, but everyone else is paying for the bubbles bursting, the real estate bubble, the financial bubble at every level. Look at what's happened to Europe in the last few years. We see a lot of news of how many Europeans are coming to Brazil for jobs. But a lot of the Europeans are staying home. I go to Greece, I go to Rome, I go to Spain to work with the youth. And the youth are returning to the land. The government in Rome has announced that every empty space must be occupied for a garden to solve the unemployment problem. Creative work and agroecology are the solution to the unemployment crisis for the future. And we've done calculations. The corporations want total control on the world economy. 
but they can only offer jobs to 3%. For them, 97% of humanity is redundant. And we have to declare we are not redundant. We will be creative, we will be productive, we will take care of our needs. We do not need you. And we definitely don't need you to tell us we are disposable. Look at the language they are creating. They've gone way beyond redundancy now. They do talk about disposable people. And they assume we are all just going to slink away and die. No! We are going to sow the future exactly what each of you is doing. And not only is it the case that the corporations want total control over our resources, over the oxygen capacity of the trees, over the carbon capacity of the soil. They would like to own everything, but they would also like to control every human being. So those little tips of the iceberg of Snowden revealing the surveillance of the US intelligence and military on every civics exchange anywhere in the world. What is Via Campesina talking about today? They're keeping watch. Monsanto is working with Blackwater. Now, when I save seeds, to me it's such a joyful, free experience. I want everyone to participate. But Monsanto has to bring in the largest private military on the planet to push its GMO seeds to spy on scientists who do authentic work, to go after activists. And they're imagining that this militarized surveillance system will create fear in civil society and in people. They're doing more. Of course, Monsanto wrote the law of patterns in the WTO, they said we were the patient, the diagnostician, and physician all in one. We defined a problem, and the problem they defined was that farmers save seeds. And then they say we offered a solution, and the solution is it should now be a crime to save seeds. And the reason I started saving seeds is because I think it's a crime if you don't save seeds. It's a crime if you don't exchange seeds. In our culture, it is considered a sin if you allow seed to disappear. In 1815 in my region, people died of hunger, but the seed bins were full because seed is for the future. For us, saving seeds is our highest ecological, social, ethical duty. We will not allow this to be turned into a crime. These compulsory registration laws that are being written all over the world. In Europe, the European Commission has drafted a new law on May the 6th, making it illegal to have your own seed. It should be illegal to have GMO seeds. And every government should be protecting the biodiversity under their obligation under the Convention on Biological Diversity. And yet they're working for the corporations to write laws to criminalize our freedoms and to criminalize the diversity that is the basis of food security. Agribusiness can only move forward through the rule of fear, through the rule of terror, and through divide and rule. Dividing people up on the basis, at least in the rest of the world, on the basis of religion, on the basis of ethnicity, on every basis possible. Our response to this has to be through fearlessness and courage. Fear can only rule if you subject yourself to fear. And if you tell yourself, I will not be afraid, there's nothing to be afraid of if, because they are criminals. How can we become afraid of criminals ruling? We have to put every energy of ours to get rid of the criminals controlling our food system through every measure in our hands. We are sowing the seeds of love and solidarity and compassion. 
and these seeds are strong and resilient and robust. From 2nd of October, which is Gandhi's birth anniversary, to 16th of October, which is World Food Day, we are inviting everyone, and I hope all of you will take these actions. Why 2nd of October? Because it isn't just that Gandhi taught us non-violence. More importantly, he taught us that through non-violence, we must not cooperate with unjust laws. This is what he said. This is what he said in 1901 in South Africa, when they were dividing people according to race. And he refused to obey those laws of apartheid. And then he came back to India and taught us to disobey the British when they tried to impose salt laws so they could have a monopoly on salt. He walked to the beach, picked up some salt and said, nature gives it for free. We need it for our survival. We will continue to make salt. We will not obey your laws. And the salt laws could never be implemented. He called this non-cooperation Satyagraha, the fight for truth. And he said, as long as the superstition exists that people should obey unjust laws, so long will slavery exist. The Monsantos and the Cargills, the criminals of the contemporary food system, are working through writing laws that make every freedom related to food illegal. The freedom of farmers to have seeds, the freedom of eaters to have healthy food. Healthy food is declared dangerous. I read somewhere that local chicken is considered unhealthy, factory chicken is considered healthy. Brazil. In Italy, food laws made local cheese illegal. In India, and the Americans wrote our food safety laws. Um, the hands are the most dangerous thing in food, even though the only good food you can have has to be touched by hand, whether it is being processed by hand or being cooked by hand. Touched by hand is illegal, but poisoned in factories is safe. Now, when that kind of criminal action becomes the law and the right action is criminalized, we do need to look around us and see what are the laws being put in place that become a block to food sovereignty and seed sovereignty. Which are the laws that we must disobey for higher law? The law of justice, the law of sustainability, the law of the earth family, of us being one with the earth. And all the way in that fortnight, we hope everyone will reclaim freedom by making every farm and every agroecological farm a seed sanctuary, ensuring it's a sanctuary for bees and soil microorganisms. Wildlife sanctuaries are actually our agroecological farms, not the areas where human beings have been pushed aside. The richest diversity is in land that has been loved and cared for. And we need to plant gardens of hope everywhere. Some places just in a balcony. Look at that pot with that banana. We need to stop thinking that agribusiness is the solution. We need to realize wherever there's soil and wherever there's loving hands and wherever there's a will to grow food, there is food. And food can be grown everywhere. Food must be grown everywhere. And the teachers for this transition will be the peasants will be the women, will be the grandmothers, because they have the, been the ones who have the longest history of knowledge. And with them will work the scientists, and the youth, and the children, and the chefs, and the retailers. 
Why is the agroecological model a solution to the unemployment crisis? Because there's no one place for the youth to enter, all of you in this room. You need the artists who made this hall beautiful. You need the musicians who sang. You need the scientists like Miguel. Everything that human beings do can be done to bring the ecological revolution in agriculture. Everything. Of course, food production has to be at the heart of it. And that is why for 16th of October, which is World Food Day, we have a proposal. And again, I hope all of you will join in your own way. Now, there's something called the World Food Prize, which was started in the honor of Norman Borlaug, who brought chemicals into farming and brought violence to India and was given a Nobel Peace Prize. It's called the World Food Prize and Monsanto and Syngenta are all sponsors of the prize. This year, because they're being criticized so much and the world marched against Monsanto, they thought they were being very smart. They gave themselves the prize. So when we were asked, so what are you going to do? Of course, we wrote statements and that has embarrassed them and many of our colleagues, uh, Hans Herren, uh, Frankie Lepay, are all being invited now to debate these people. But the more important idea that came in response was, why don't we, on 16th October, honor the real food heroes in each of our communities, give the real food prize to real food heroes who are the agroecological producers wherever we are and they're all over the world and we turn the 16th of October into a huge celebration of local farms, small farms, ecological farms and good eating. And next year is the year of the family farm. So we don't stop on 16th of October 2030, we just carry on till we've got rid of those rascals and the earth can breathe free and farmers can live and the little babies in their prams have safe, healthy lives and generations after them. Thank you.